Dr. Björn Halsberg. He's professor in theoretical chemistry, and his speciality is chemometrics. So please start the uh, beginning process. Thank you very much. Um, so <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about is uh, a tutorial uh, on how chemometrics can be used to optimize organic synthesis. So the starting point for me here is to assume that um, you already have a route to your target molecule. Uh, but we also know that in order to move forward, uh, you have to adjust multiple factors, controllable factors, in order to uh, optimize uh, different responses, such as the selectivity, the yield, and so on. And examples of such uh, controllable factors are the concentration of reagents, temperature, uh, the use of catalyst, stirring speed, and so on. So the question is, how can we um, explore this uh, in a more systematic way. So one way to think about this problem is to turn it into uh, a problem of mathematics. So we're trying to uh, explore a function. We can call this the response surface model or function. So we have n controllable factors, x1, x2, and so on. And given a certain setting of each of these factors, we will get a response we can assume, for the simplicity, the yield of the reaction. So that means we have a, a, a function that we can assume exists, which is y equal to f, a function of these uh, controllable factors. And uh, on the right here, we can see a very simple example involving just two controllable factors. So that gives us a, a three-dimensional plot where you have a surface and you see that this uh, temperature and uh, um, the enzyme load, I just uh, uh, found this image on the internet <coughs> to give an example of what such uh, simple response surface models could look like. So that means each of those um, points in the bottom of that surface plot correspond to a single experiment. And the height is then the yield for that experiment. So <clears throat> that means in order to get this model or this surface, we need to uh, perform several experiments. So that, of course, leads us to the next question. How do we actually do these experiments in the most efficient way? And the way to do this is to use experimental design. Because experimental design is a methodology originating from statistics where you try to find the best minimum set of experiment that will uh, e e extract the maximum of information. So that's the core idea behind experimental design. So in experimental design, we're talking about these factors. Obviously, uh, we have both controllable and uncontrollable factors, like the weather cannot be controlled, but we can try to account for it in different ways. I'm not going to talk about that today. But when we have controllable factors, we have things like quantitative factors that are usually some kind of real value attached to it, like the temperature, pressure, or something like that, and qualitative factors, whether you use a, a, a catalyst or not, yes or no, or it could be a category like red, green, and blue. So these are the two main categories of factors that we are uh, facing. And in order to move forward to, to uh, have as much efficiency as possible uh, out of our exper experiments, uh, we need to perform a discretization. Because if you think about it, that you have n different factors, and each of them can have a continuous setting, you have, in principle, an infinite number of possible experiments that could be performed. So therefore, one way to reduce the number of experiments is to actually reduce the number of levels that are possible for each of the controllable factors. So the most uh, common one is to just use two levels, typically low and high. Uh, but obviously, we could also have more than that. 
So the discretization here is performed such that it is spanning the experimental space of interest. So you have to decide what you mean by low, high, or whatever, and that is based on your background knowledge of the, uh, the system. So here's a very simple example. Um, we assume that we have just two factors, the temperature and the pH, and we want to have just two levels, low and high, and we give them uh, the sign variable settings like minus one for low and plus one for high. We could have used something else, but this is the most common one, and they're usually uh, indicated by plus and minus to make it simple. And then we have to decide what do we need, mean by low and high. So that's where your expertise comes in, because you need to then say, uh, in this case, pH between 2 and 9 in my just imaginary example. Uh, that would be silly if your system is operating on a completely different pH level. So you have to take responsibility where your setting is located. Uh, so in theory, you can only have four uh, number of experiments here. So that's the, the world, that's the experimental world, and this is how we can visualize this as point in a so-called experimental space. Well, each of the axes here correspond to uh, a factor that can be controlled, and each point uh, in this space corresponds to a single experiment. So you can imagine now that uh, out of the, uh, the screen, you have the height or the yield, if you can use that as an example of the response here throughout the, the talk. That is what you want to study. So for each of these points, you also have a height. But of course, it's getting more hard when it's more than two factors to, to think about. All right, so, but we could have set more levels, like three levels. Uh, we can include, let's say, a middle layer. And that is sometimes needed, especially if we want to study in more detail how this response surface is, um, is uh, looking or, or behaving, then you might need more levels. Or in that case, you will get a more finely gridded space, so to speak. Okay, <clears throat> so that leads us to uh, something called factorial designs. I'm not going to spend much time on it, just mention that this is what we call these type of designs. So assuming that we have k levels for each of the factors, we have k to the n number of experiments theoretically we could perform. And as you can see, this increases very rapidly. So um, these full factorial designs, even when k is equal to 2, which is the most common, uh, at least in the beginning, uh, it's, it's, it's increasing rapidly. So in order to handle this problem of uh, too many uh, possible experiments, uh, we turn to something called fractional factorial designs. And what they are is what the name indicates is a fraction of the total number of full factorial designs. And we tend to write this as k i minus p, where p is telling you how much you, you reduce it by. Uh, here I show you a very simple example of what is uh, happening when you do this. So in this case, we have three factors, a, b, and c. And uh, if we did a full factorial uh, experiment, it will give you two to the three, uh, eight experiments. But assume now that this is too much. You can't afford eight experiments for some reason. You can only uh, afford a fraction, let's say the half, two to the third, the minus one. Uh, then the question becomes, which of the eight are you removing to get just four? And uh, so this is the, the, the matrix of the, the so-called <coughs> design uh, matrix, but I'll show you uh, graphically what could happen. <coughs> so in this case, if you had a, a full factorial design for three factors, it would correspond to the corners of a cube. But since you can't afford all of them, the question is, which four corners do you remove? Well, uh, the, the main idea is that you try to localize uh, the, the remaining four ones so such that they span that cube as uh, good as possible. So it becomes like a tetrahedron, and you have another solution, obviously, that could be used here. So that is the main idea, that you select um, experimental points in your space that they are 
covering as much of the experimental volume as possible. And that can actually be used as a criterion in certain types of experimental designs to guide you in where you should put your experiments. And then we have this design matrix. And what the design matrix is, in a way, can be seen as the instruction manual <laughs> to the experimentalist. Uh, uh, it will show you uh, what experiments you are planning to perform. So in this case, the plus means the high setting on the factor, and minus is the low setting, assuming now just two level uh, factorial design. And the response, assuming yield again as an example, it will look something like this. And uh, so the first run, for instance, is a high setting of all the three factors. So that is what you uh, take with you to the lab in order to <coughs> twist the knobs, so to speak, to, to get uh, the results you're looking for. It's very important to point out that uh, the actual ordering of the experiments being performed should be randomized. Because uh, when you set it up in a systematic way, there are certain ways of setting up these uh, design matrices that will show a, a very clear pattern. And you should avoid that uh, because you might get some uh, effects uh, of uh, uh, uncontrollable factors that can affect your um, results. That's why you tend to randomize uh, uh, things in order to remove things that you can't control. And um, another thing you need to decide on is the model. So that is the mathematical form of that underlying response uh, model. So in most cases, you use a quadratic model. So you can see how it looks like. You have that the yield is equal to a constant plus um, a linear combination of the, of the, the main factors, uh, bj times the xj. So the xj is just the effect of just one factor uh, going from low to high. And then the last term are all the cross interactions between uh, two, but you could have multiple uh, interaction terms. You could have x1, x2, and x3, and so on. And you also have the so-called quadratic terms. And that is needed if you want to find the optimum. You need that curvature. And when you do that, you actually have to do more than two levels, just to warn you about that. Um, so what you are interested in now are these B coefficients. These are regression coefficients, and they will be um, taken or estimated from data from after you have your uh, design matrix. Uh, you have enough data to uh, set up uh, um, uh, a system to solve to do regression. Yeah, so assuming now that you have performed a fractional factorial design, um, uh, you have removed the information. And as always, if you get something uh, like, if you do something like that, there is uh, uh, a price to pay for it. And the uh, price to pay for that is what we call confounding. And that means that when you're looking at the regression coefficients or the effects, you cannot distinguish those uh, effects from other uh, uh, effects being uh, giving, the, uh, giving the same result, so to speak. So there's almost like a contamination, if you like, or a confusion that is uh, 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 causing problems here. And this confusion can be, to some extent, be rectified or actually be minimized. Uh, but in most cases, you're happy if you just know what um, um, effects are confounded with each other because then you can say that, oh, uh, this main effect, for instance, which is the most important thing, is confounded with a higher order effect. And we say, okay, if it's a high enough order, we don't care so much. But let's say if you see that there is a confounding between two main effects, you don't want that because the main effects are usually considered more likely to be significant than a higher order effect. So the higher the order, the less significant. Uh, the effects are assumed to be. So this is just um, 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 an attempt to, to visualize uh, the heuristic that you tend to follow when you do optimization in this case. So uh, when you start out, the question is, what are the most important factors? 
In some cases, you don't know exactly what factors you should concentrate on. So in that case, you have to do a screening uh, to determine what uh, subset of possible factors are really important. And in that case, it is important to perform as few experiments as possible because you're faced with a lot of factors, maybe 20, 100, I don't know. And of course, you can't do a full factorial design and you have to do some kind of fractional uh, factorial design or so-called screening designs where they're heavily confounded designs and uh, hopefully they will give you some indication to what main effects are significant and important. So um, there's uh, something called plaquette berman designs where you can uh, do um, uh, um, the number of experiments is uh, um, supposed to be um, around a multiple of four of the number of variables and then you can use um, uh, equal number of experiments to the number of uh, variables and then determine what variables are important. But it is uh, uh, a bit risky game because the confounding is so heavy that uh, it is a problem. But that is what you do still, you try to do the best you can and the result from those screening experiments will maybe point in the direction to what factors are important. And then you select the most important factors you think you should work with and then you can concentrate on more traditional uh, fractional factorial or full factorial designs, do the design and then maybe uh, that is not sufficient in order to localize an optimum and then you have to maybe move the design in a certain direction because analyzing the result will tell you where you should go in this uh, n-dimensional landscape, so to speak. And uh, one, once you're quite close to the optimum, then you can do other things uh, which is related to the uh, characterization of uh, the optimum because we tend to be interested in a maximum or maybe a minimum, but definitely not a saddle point. So then you need to know what type of neighborhood around the optimum you have. Okay, so I'm gonna do a little um, uh, uh, switch or a change in the talk here because now I'm moving into the second part. And that second part is unique to chemistry and not what you would find in uh, in statistics, as we talked about all. Um, so this is uh, what is being called as reaction space. So that is, uh, in addition to changing variables like the temperature and the pH and stuff like that, you also have to change things like the substrate, the reagent and the solvent in an organic uh, reaction. And uh, the question becomes, how do you use these methods that we discussed to optimize the selection of substrate reagents and, and, and solvent. And this becomes much more difficult and we need to make a little new invention here. And uh, the invention that I'm gonna talk about is called Principal Properties, which was um, pioneered by two guys uh, called uh, Rolf Carlson and Turbin Lundstedt. And uh, uh, I have uh, the, some of the results I will present here are taken from papers from these two uh, guys. So, um, what are principal properties? Well, as you remember, uh, I talked about controllable factors. So that is okay and easy to understand when you're controlling something like temperature or the pressure. It's like a, <laughs> like a knob you turn. But what happens when you try to use the same thinking on uh, structure. There is no structure knob somewhere, at least that is not obvious. So how can we turn the experimental design machinery into something that can be applicable to something as uh, complicated as chemical structure? And this is where the principal uh, properties comes in, which are like ordinary controllable factors but actually linear combinations of other factors or properties. And uh, these linear, linear combinations, they're also called latent variables. So we use uh, a technique called the principal component analysis technique to create 
in a way, artificial factors that can be treated as if they are like temperature or the, the pressure. And then we apply the experimental design machinery to this new type of variable or factor space. So that's the main idea behind principal properties. OK, so let me give uh, an intuitive uh, uh, introduction to the PCA method. It's a very powerful method. Um, so uh, the way I want to uh, in introduce that is by showing you a very simple data set called the people's data set. And it's just a, um, a series of uh, people. You have the names there. There are some boys and some girls. And they have several properties for each person. The, the actual data set is larger than the three you see here. But there's a point why I just include three variables. So in this case, every person is uh, described in terms of height, weight, and the shoe, sh shoe size. So that means we are able to actually plot this because it's only three dimensions, and it looks something like this. And when you do that, you can see that these variables are correlated, not surprising that they are. Now, what we do in principal component analysis is to create new axes, okay? And the new axes, they are pointing in the maximum direction of the data set, and they are orthogonal to each other. So you see the blue line here is the first principal component, and it's possible to make two more. So you can extract as many as you have variables. But we tend to make use of much less principal components than the original variables, because we use PCA to compress the data. It's very effective for that. So as you can see, just one principal component is explaining a lot of the variance, but um, actually, there is two uh, principal components in this data set. But for the understanding of what a principal component really is, we can just play with uh, this uh, single component. So what is happening now that each of these people, they are points in this three-dimensional space. And we can project them onto that new uh, this new um, coordinate axis. And this is called the principal component. And we can then get the shadow of each person onto that line. And that will give, you, uh, uh, give us the coordinate of that person on that line. And that coordinate is a score. And that score is like an ordinary <coughs> variable. So by doing this, we have uh, turned a three-dimensional complicated problem into just one dimension that is maybe capturing something important. And if you look at this um, uh, principal component, it is capturing something that is more hidden than maybe the three variables we started with. So uh, in my lectures, I'm using this, uh, this example, and I call it body size. So body size is more fundamental than weight and height and shoe size, because we, because we could invent a lot of other uh, variables that, uh, that are correlated with this more fundamental variable, such as cir circumference around your stomach or around the head. I mean, we, the, the list goes on. And that, that would be additional variables, but they would all be correlated with this more fundamental thing underneath. So PCA can be used to uh, extract and discover more hidden variation going on in your data set. Right, so this is more or less uh, what I probably said. So uh, we can now use these scores. These are then the principal properties. And we are going to apply this to chemical problems in order to be able to use the experimental design machinery to structure. So this is just uh, a summary of what is happening to this uh, data set. Actually, it's two-dimensional. Uh, when you're using more variables, because you have things like people are using spectacles, if it's a boy or girl, and things like that. And then you can see the first dimension is related to the body size, and the second is actually related to age, because all, all the people on the top are older than the ones in, in, in the bottom of this plot. 
So that's something that is quite interesting to discover. Anyway, so in this case we have two uh, principal components that are explaining more than 80% of the variance in the original uh, data table. So let's move from people to, to molecules. Uh, so uh, the molecule in general is a very complex thing. It vibrates, it rotates, it's, uh, it's quantum mechanical properties, all kinds of things are happening. So how can we describe this uh, in terms of um, uh, numbers? Because uh, what we really need now is to take this molecule and get it into a vectorial form. Because we need that in order to use all the statistical and machine learning methods. We need to have it in a comparable vectorial form. So that means every molecule is represented as a point in the n-dimensional space where each of those um, um, dimensions correspond to descriptors, where the descriptors are chosen to reflect some interesting and useful property of the molecules, such as the charge or charges, polarizability, could be homo-lumo gaps, things like that. And it could be everything from just a handful of descriptors to thousands, literally. So the question is, what do we do with this? Because obviously we can't do experimental design in like a 500 dimensional uh, variable space. So that's where uh, principal component comes in. So now I'm going to show you something you're not supposed to focus on because it's not so important the details here. It's just to show you the, the starting point for what we need in order to do principal property. Okay, so what you do is that you have a set of molecules, in this case I think it's amines, and uh, you select a series of descriptors that you find relevant or important. Okay, so you have the list of uh, molecules and then you have the columns uh, with the different properties. So that's your starting point. You have a data table for your uh, molecules and then you perform principal component analysis. So uh, you can see where this is taken from. So every, all the examples here from Rolf Carlson's work. Um, so examples here of properties are PKA, refractive index, proton affinity and so on. And then you end up with a score space. In this case, you can see it's just a scatter of points. So the, the scatter of these points, each point is a molecule. Okay. So then it becomes the question is, uh, well, what does these principal components mean? That is not always possible to, to, to do a qualitative understanding of what each of those uh, principal components mean. As in the people state, said, one was the body size and one was the age. Unfortunately, it's not always that simple for molecules. But sometimes uh, when you are working with a class of molecules, you will have some kind of intuitive feeling for what uh, the chemical properties are and so on. So then maybe you can discover something that, ooh, that means uh, the donor ability is one axis and accept along another, something like that. And now comes the idea of principal property. And that is that you say, if you look at the score space, it is almost like you have an ordinary two-dimensional uh, variable or, or factor space. So we treat it as if it is, uh, let's say, temperature times pressure, which means that we want to discretize this space as well. Now that's a cool idea. But somebody then wants to point out that Bjorn, every point is not possible because that's a molecule, right? It's easy to say that you have a point in the experimental space when there's temperature and the pressure. You can always adjust it, at least in theory, as much as you want. But here you have uh, that each point ne not necessarily correspond to a molecule and definitely not to what you have included, included in your uh, data set. So the solution to this is to say, well, I just take the closest neighbor to my point. So in this case, uh, we have then uh, performed a two-level discretization of each factor. And we have low, minus, and plus high for uh, the first 
uh, score and the second axis. And I have indicated those four positions with red. Okay, so in order to uh, actually say uh, here I have a selection corresponding to let's say plus minus, that that's just supposed to correspond to an actual molecule and in order to get that I need to then find the closest to that point. So that's it, how this is being done in practice. All right, so how can we use this? And I have then included an example from um, uh, a work uh, Carlson did on Will Gerot uh, Kindler reaction. And in this case, he has um, a reactant and an amine and solvent that he can change. So uh, the reactant there uh, is identified by a substituents, Y, and uh, the amines are, are, are coded by two substituents and the solvents, I think it's just a list of possible solvents. So then you have three different categories of molecules that you need to optimize in order to select the best combination. So how do you do that? How can we use this methodology? Well, what we do is that we look at each of these categories of molecules and we uh, form uh, tables of example molecules and properties and we perform um, a PCA for each of the categories. So for the substrate you have let's say 50 or whatever number of substrate you're interested in and you have lots of uh, properties. You do a PCA. Uh, in this case uh, they obtained uh, two dimensional uh, PCA models for each of these uh, three categories. So that means that uh, we have six dimensional problem. The space of variation here is six dimensional. So given the point in this six dimensional space, we have enough information to tell somebody go to the lab and do this. Because given a point in this six dimensional space, we have an example substrate, we have an example amine, and an example solvent. And once we have that, we can then look at the yield, for instance, and we get our response value, and we're happy, and we can fill in the um, design matrix. So this um, picture is from uh, the paper that I have taken the data from because I thought it actually uh, demonstrates very clearly the idea. So at the left there you see the different um, systems, that means different uh, experiments that you could perform. And you have uh, one row correspond to uh, different combinations of these factors, low and high. So the Z1, Z2 and so on. Uh, the first two correspond to the, uh, uh, the substrate and the next two uh, to the amine and the third to the, uh, to the solvent. So that means uh, you can go into the, uh, the table at the uh, right side and, 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 and understand what these combinations mean. So when you have minus, minus, if you have um, uh, the... Um, um, uh, the substrate, that is uh, when it's a CL, uh, then that is uh, the, 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 um, um, the one you're going for. But if you have minus minus for the amine, it means isopropyl amine and so on. So you can use this, it's a very compressed table, so you have to study it a little bit. <laughs> but it means that um, you can go into the uh, three scores plot. So you can see you have three a scores plot there, and they are equivalent to this one. Okay, so you have three versions of this. They don't know. They don't look exactly the same as this, but they are the same idea being used three times. So, in order to find uh, wh what to put in there, you look at minus minus, and that corresponds to the. If you look at the substrate there, that is uh, that position for. Uh, the minimum setting of the first factor and the minimum setting of the second factor. So that is minus minus codes for. So that is the lower left corner of that uh, scores plot. And that's how you fill in the, the sign matrix. And then 
you proceed to the next step, and that is to uh, fill in your design matrix. Uh, and once you have the design matrix, you can go to the lab. And uh, after you've been to the lab, you have the responses, which we assume are uh, the yields. And then you can perform regression. And regression will tell you how the different factors influence the yield. Okay? So the, the, the B coefficients, they will address um, either Z1, Z2, Z3, and so on. So if it's a positive value, you know that that factor, if you increase it, will increase the yield. If it's negative, if you increase it, it will reduce the yield. So how can we use this in terms of chemistry? And that brings me to almost the end of my presentation. So assuming now we have the result from regression, it could be uh, multiple linear regression or uh, partial least squares regression. Uh, we can assume that, let's say, we have a B coefficient for Z6, which is equal to plus 3.8. Okay, it's a positive number, right? So what is Z6? Well, let's go back. Remind us that is, the, that is related to the solvent. Okay, so that's the second axis. I can't point, unfortunately. That's the last uh, uh, two-dimensional score plot. So the C6 is the y-axis for the last score uh, here, okay? So that means when that is being selected to be a positive number, the, the re regression coefficient for that is positive, it means that we should move higher up along that axis in order to increase the yield. So that's why I, I put a, a big red arrow here, because uh, from that result, we can go back and then say, if you go in this direction, you can select a new um, solvent that is most likely going to give you high yield, given that everything else is constant. So if you have a lot of other examples that you didn't use in your experiments, you can then localize new points along this axis and then say, hmm, that's an interesting solvent. That seems to be going in the right direction. I pick it up, I put it back in, and I try my new experiment. So that's the power of principal properties. And I think it's a lot of things that we can use here because it's uh, um, combining the best from experimental design in a way, but also combining ideas from chemistry. So that uh, is... Uh, Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, um, as I said, that in order to um, start, maybe you can just do two-level uh, designs or yeah, factorial designs. But once you, you need to go actually find the optimum, you need uh, uh, more than two levels because otherwise you wouldn't be able to. <laughs> you can only see things like that. So um, that is one thing. But uh, selecting the, the actual uh, settings of the factors is very important because you don't want to be in an area of your experimental space which is not necessary or really interesting. Uh, so that is where you as an experimenter comes in to decide uh, actually where in that space you should explore further because you don't want to waste time. It's so hard to do experiments. I don't know if that was answering your question. Okay. <laughs>
I'm not sure if I know, uh, understand exactly what you mean by, but you, what you could do is to do some pre-processing to emphasize certain variables. Maybe that's where you're going, that the height could be made even more important by multiplying those um, rows with a number. Okay. Uh, but um, you want to keep it as a latent variable. <laughs> Okay, so, so you want everything else to be orthogonal to that. Yeah, okay, that of course is possible. Hmm? Well, de-optimization is a, a different uh, uh, way of doing things where you have um, an experimental space that could be, in a way, irregular. It could mean that, let's say that you, in experiment, if, if this blackboard is your experimental space, it might be that in this portion you can't touch it because uh, the machine explodes or <laughs> is too expensive or something like that. And then you say it to the experimenter that if you use experimental design, it will optimize the location of the experiments according to the principle of um, the optimality. It's related to the determinant of the um, the x transposed x. But, um, yeah, so what, what you are talking about is also a little bit similar to factor analysis, where you are emphasizing on interpretation that certain factors should be more interpretable. And that is uh, similar to what we're doing in PCA, but PCA is just uh, completely abstract factors. But if you're using factor analysis, you can force uh, that some, some of my knowledge of the variables can be put to use to how you actually create your model. That's true. But I haven't worked much with the factor analysis myself, not directly. Uh, I have one question. Yep. Your formula, you have only one response. Yeah. Uh, you have more than one. Yes, in many cases. Uh, but uh, in order to make those uh, slides as simple as possible, I just used this, uh, the example of just one response. But you're quite right that in, in a, a real life, you have a multiple response uh, problem. Uh, yeah, uh, of course, things become more difficult. But uh, then you can use uh, desirability functions that actually are linear combinations of, of responses. Uh, or you could use uh, oh. yeah, the, the other techniques for, for handling multiple y values. Mm.